three wins out of three at the start of the season, at the start of this new era under Arna Slot. This is the breakdown, 11 shots to eight, three apiece on target. Now, Liverpool had 62 shots last season against Manchester United to score twice. This season, only 11 so far, but they've already managed three goals. Those three United efforts on target all came with the scoreline already at 3-0. Uh, they had twice as many runs into the opposition box as well, Liverpool, though Manchester United, for what it's worth, edged the possession. Now, if you had just walked in, hadn't watched the game, saw those statistics, maybe you might think, well, it was a pretty even game. Does that tell the story, Roy? Uh, absolutely not. No, it was far from an even game. Liverpool very, very good, very efficient, look sharp going forward, look stronger, look fitter. Uh, United, listen, do you know what, you can try and dress it up a little bit, but United were shocking, really shocking. Um, every time Liverpool went forward, they looked like they were going to score. One or two passes they're in on the United's back four, obviously a couple of big, well, certainly a couple of big mistakes from an experienced player. Then a mistake as well at the start of the second half, 3-0. Yeah, not good. You know, there's a lot, been a lot of good PR for United the last few months about plans for the stadium, blah, blah, blah. But today, in a big game against Liverpool, it's just, I'm just, just really disappointed that United didn't turn up. And uh, I just think playing for what, what playing for Man United, what should it be about? They, they get, they get, I'm always surprised when the game's over after 50 or 60 minutes when you're playing for Man United. I know you can have an off day and you can have bad days, but for the game to be over after an hour, it's, it's, it's hard, to, hard to accept. Three Don't goals, know, three assists, know. three games into the season. As Daniel said, it, it looks like he's David really Williams. enjoying his uh, football. Uh, you know, talk about world-class performance. He was brilliant. He's a tread, his goals record, his little touches, his movement. And again, when you watch them live, you see the bigger picture. Honestly, great example. You know, I really enjoy watching him. Obviously, it's hard to take for United today, but you've got to give credit where it's due. He is a world-class player. Roy didn't like our exchange, they had a little bit of banter together, you know, just... Yeah, I know, but I, I, listen, I, I warned you before, you got to say a humble and victory and defeat. <laughs> you obviously didn't listen, <laughs> did you? I was having a chat with my old pal. That wasn't a chat, that was a was bromance it? thing going on. <laughs> Daniel, are Liverpool, Liverpool going to let him go? I'd be surprised, to Stand be honest. To Liverpool. I'd be surprised, I, I'd be surprised. I think Mo has obviously achieved pretty much everything he could at the club, but I've not seen him happier. The way he was speaking then was as if, like, you know, I want to be at the club. If the club are going to give him what he wants, then he's going to stay. That's inevitably what's going to happen. But the way he looked there, he looked happy to me. I've not seen him smiling ear to ear like that before. So, to be fair, I really hope he does stay because he's been magnificent. He's in control of all of that. Yeah. I, I know the clubs have policies about lend a contract when players get to 31, 32, whatever Liverpool situation is. But he's in total control of that. He'll decide what he's going to do. Whatever contract they might come up with, you think they'll obviously have to offer him the contract. He's an amazing player. But he will have, well, put it this way, he will have plenty of options. Yeah. He certainly will. And you see how sharp he is today, He's talking about almost this kind of freshness within the club. Uh, and let's talk about these goals from a Liverpool perspective, first of all, Danny. There's loads of time to pick the bones out of United later. Absolutely. I mean, in this moment here, we, we mentioned Casemiro earlier on, but it's the, the cross from Mo is absolutely magnificent. Subbers lies awareness to leave it, and Luis Diaz decisive with the header. It's a fantastic move, to be fair. For me, I, th I feel like when you're looking at the numbers here, we're seeing five versus three, man. And they're this all is... like sprinters, those four that were, that were coming behind Diogo Jota, all ready to fly out the blocks. Well, yeah, you, you, the thing is, you're licking your lips as an attacker if you're running at the defence and you see three defenders, five players barreling forward. In the end, it was too open and Liverpool punished the mistakes. That United, aren't, United. United aren't good enough to play like that. They can't have their full-backs getting forward like that. As soon as they make one mistake against the good teams, they're, they're going to get punished. We're, we're almost going around in circles talking about it. They're not good. If Casemiro's made a mistake, of course he has. An experienced player, he's got to take a touch in it. But he's got, he's got full-backs running ahead of him. and it's, it's just not on. Just have a look at this as well from Diogo Jota, Daniel, and, and the role of the, the centre-forward almost in, in this position, in this situation. Yeah, yeah, and, that, and that, that's the awareness of him to say, I'm going to make a run now, I'm making a run that's going to pull the defenders this way. And he's telling everyone where yeah. the ball needs to go at the Absolutely. same time. 
fantastic from him because it's an unselfish run as well. You can easily say, I'm going to peel to the back post and try and score. But to do that is fair play to him. Just three games into his uh, Liverpool era in the Premier League, Arna Slot has won at Old Trafford by three goals to nil. And he is so cool. He is so calm, Daniel. He seems pretty unflappable. Early stages. He seems pretty <laughs> yeah. unflappable. He must think the Premiership is easy. Isn't <laughs> yeah. yeah. What's the He's big deal? He's making it look pretty he easy. Does, so he far. Is. He's a chill guy, man. I, I really, you know, respect and like how he's approached it. To be fair, um, specifically when he's speaking to to the likes of us, but also the performances that he's he's embedded within the players because for them to pick up his tactics this fast. You see the rotations that they're doing now. You're seeing the passes going into Salah that weren't there. You'd see the Just rotations. Just explain that Trent. a little bit more. What do you see as the biggest differences? I think that they're on the front. I'm not going to say they're on the front foot more, but I think there's more rotations within the team. There's players higher up the pitch. Obviously, Sobers lies picking up nice positions in between the gaps. You've got passes going from the right back into the midfielder that are then going into Salah. There's balls going from the defender straight into Salah, which, are, which wasn't the case prior to that. It was maybe more of a transition style. This seems like it's a lot more control-based, um, but I like where I like where it's yeah, going. Yeah, and sometimes we discuss that manager when he comes into a job will take time, will take time to settle in, will take time for the players to get his ideas, what what way they're going to play. But you're looking today, you're going, he looks like he's been here a long time, mm. and the players are they're all up to speed with what he wants. The players coming off the bench, his decision making, and of course when you win, everything seems to, everything seems amazing in his decision making. But it looks like. They've all picked up his messages very, very quick, and, and clearly that's a sign of a, obviously a very good coach. And if there were doubts within the dressing room, what impact would these results have on those players? Well, you can't beat winning. And to be fair, Sal has made a good point. There are when a new, a new manager comes in, listen, he's replacing an amazing manager. A legend. But, uh, an, yeah, of course, exactly. But sometimes it's just a new voice for people like Salah, who, as he said, he, sometimes you do get comfortable, whether you like it or subconsciously. So a new voice, new ideas in training, and he'll obviously have new staff with him. And sometimes that gives the players a little bit of a, a bit of a lift because Liverpool obviously have got quality players, but he's also made the point as well. There's challenges to come up now in terms of midweek games, travelling, Champions League, and that's another challenge considering he only got what they only made one signing. Welcome, Jamie <laughs> Carragher and Gary Neville. I'm sure we'll get into the different emotions of that game. We'll get into the United perspective as well before uh, we leave you. But we'll have a, a look through the goals uh, as a starting point. Uh, we'll, we'll revisit the first goal scored by Luis Diaz. And there was a theme which we discussed with Arna Slot, guys. And that was Manchester United losing possession and the way that Liverpool capitalised by leaving those wide players high up the pitch. Yeah, I mean, you, you talk about Liverpool in this fixture last season, that's what they didn't do. They didn't capitalise on these situations. So it's still the same manager. More often than not, it's the same players for Manchester United. So we're seeing the same things. Talk about players behind the ball, the rest defence, the fullbacks are really high. And when you look at the players they've got there, Casemiro and De Ligt, to be as fair as well, not the quickest. And actually, Diaz he does really well there. Because Sobos lies just in front of him, there's talk of maybe a handball as well. But the fact I thought when the cross came in initially, I mean, it's brilliant from Mo Salah. I mean, if that was on his left foot, we'd say it was a great cross. But doing that on his right foot, and Sobos lies does well, and Diaz does even better to make sure he finds the back of the net. You have to give credit to Graver Birch on that goal as well, because he won it back and also played the pass to Salah. Gary, what about this one? But the, these, this, isn't, this isn't sort of like, um, you know, high pressing or brilliant defensive work. Manchester United's in possession play in those deep areas was absolutely terrible but when they lose it but it's when they lose it it's where the fullback you, you, is it a setup so issue wrong. is it a setup issue no, where that central no, midfield player that, that honest, deep pivot no, no, is no, getting no, the ball Dave, there are no options for no, they're it they're not Dave they're individual errors they're individual errors that basically are terrible areas you know when we played at United me and Danny Sirwin would go forward and leave our two centre backs on the ball and with Roy Keane and Paul Paul Scholes and if they give the ball away we'd be in a bit of trouble but they didn't do it that often. You wouldn't be that high, Gary. You wouldn't be that high from that position. I don't think so. Not the two of you. Do you have sympathy then with Casemiro and also Kobe Mainu in, in, in what, when they're receiving the ball, what's in front of them? Well, not sympathy, because at this level, they expect to, they expect to, do, to do better. But it still shouldn't be as simple as when there's one mistake like that, when you're 40, 50, that one pass, somebody's in on goal. Sh I don't think it should be as simple as that. But it is. We, we saw it a few weeks ago, and we see it again with this one. And again, they've got to do better. Look at Manu. He's, he, listen, he's had a brilliant few months. He loses it there. And look at this. If you just stop it there, I don't think that should ever happen. Once again, the two fullbacks, they're, not, they're just coming back into the picture. You, if you're a fullback and you see your midfield getting a let, you should always be expecting the worst going, he might lose it here. 
But no. the two of them are out of the picture. Uh, Roy, you, I, I'm not sure, honestly, because as the ball used to travel in to you or Scholes, it, I'd be flying on the no, far side. No, 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 I'd be trusting. I'd be trusting that not the when he's got, not when he's not when he's got his back to play. If I, if I'm facing up the pitch and I expect you to be running, of course, but he's still not in proper control of that. That's what you'd say to your teammate, unless you see your mate in control of it. So you think it's a setup problem, Roy? A, a, a bit, a bit of everything, yeah. I just think if you're full back, you pass it in. You should, as a defender, we always say, expect the worst. Expect your mate to lose it. But they're running back in. They're on the outside looking in. They should be back inside. And then if you see your mate in a good position, you go, listen, I can run onto it. That's what I think. I mean, it goes on. Listen, there's a lot to get into. We'll get into it. I mean, that is so bad from the goalkeeper. I mean, that was awful to let that goal in. But I'm. Gave him the eyes. But, but go back to what you're mentioning, Dave, in terms of what, what, what's the plan when they get the ball, if you like. Now, I don't think there really is one. I think it's a bit like individual player, if a midfield player does something good then he'll find a nice pass. In three games under Arne slot, I can see two or three things with the midfield players, like for instance today McAllister, they've got a pattern of play going where when it comes to me, he goes one touch, he's done it three times today, that's something that you know you've worked on. There was one, The one where I said, I think in commentary, where they play a couple of passes, then they get into Salah's feet, you can see that after three games. I don't think there's anything, and we're already into the third year of Tanag that I go, that's what they do in that situation. And that's why I think they have problems. When they're in midfield, you look up and it's a bit like anybody could be in any position making any different run. Yeah. And remember last year, United, how many, home ga- how many home games did United do last year? And we were here a couple of weeks ago. And if Fulham were a little bit better, they would have punished Man United. But the fact is, today, so United are making the same mistakes from last year. They've done it so far to see. Even at Brighton, it was a bit a game of, you know, who's going to win it, you could lose it, whatever. And United are playing that way. And again, when they do give it away and they make mistakes, which is going to happen because teams are going to do the homework like Liberal River did. said, look, lads, if we win it high up the pitch and we press them, the manager said, he says, we know there are two full-backs up the pitch. We're going to have... We're going to have an extra body, an extra, and when you have that quality to go with it, you will be punished. We'll, we'll hear from uh, Eric Ten Hag shortly. Daniel, do you think there's anything different about Liverpool than one, once they were winning back possession no. compared to previous seasons? I mean, no. Jamie did a big piece of analysis on Monday Night Football about them almost being a bit too helter-skelter when they were charging through on goal. Liverpool? Yeah, last season. Oh, yeah, I think this year there's a, there's a calmness there, I would say. I think that they have ways to get into positions now um but i think it's the new messaging and i think just the players have kind of grasped it players are in positions now subbers lies in the hole he's able to to you know affect the game higher up the pitch um like i said just the, the way that they're breaking teams down and playing through they've got ways to play through now before it was maybe rotations with trent coming in midfield so on and so forth but for me when i talk about man united i actually think you need defensive midfielders or someone who's very defensive minded two player four four in my opinion or four it looked like four two four at times so if you're leaving two guys in there they obviously have to have an immense capacity to run and also defensive minded which is why obviously they signed Ugarte it's clear it's well, clear to see do you think Ugarte you know, Gary would make the difference would have made the difference today playing in that position I don't know but I mean yeah, players can make individual errors like Casemiro did for the first goal and Ugarte may give a ball away like that at times whether that would lead to a goal or not I don't know the difference for Liverpool for me and why they scored those goals is that last time what we saw a lot of was maybe Nunez on the ball Gakpo not at his best Diaz the ball fell to Mo Salah. Mo Salah is a different level than any of the players that are playing out on that pitch today. He's a different level and he's absolutely world class. So for me, the reason sometimes it can look a bit frantic for Liverpool is when it ends up with maybe Diaz or it ends up with Nunez or it ends up with Gakpo and they can look a little bit sort of like unorthodox and a little bit raw. Whereas Salah gets the ball in those two areas and he's just perfect and precise. Jamie, and that was the difference. Jamie, he did say to us, Mo Salah, I know you weren't, you weren't here at that time, he did say to us, this is my last season at Liverpool, he said, I haven't heard from the club. Well, there is a positive out today. <laughs> <laughs> this is my last appearance at Old Trafford, but it almost sounded a little bit like... Negotiations. He didn't sound like nothing, Dave. <laughs> Stop trying to instigate. So he's over there trying to instigate some... He said what he said. Look, you answer it, but look, I, I, I personally... I, I don't know, man. I mean, I, we've just been speaking on the podcast, and I actually... I think Mo Salah is obsessed a little bit like Ronaldo in, in, in scoring records, appearance and records, longevity in the game. And I, th- I think for most of us, you think when you get to 35, you, you're sort of done in, in, in football. I think the way that lad looks after himself, I think he's probably looking at maybe playing until he's 40 or certainly late 30s. I don't think a Saudi situation, if you like, is on the cards next season for Mo Salah. He's too good a player. He's playing for, in the best league in the world. He's playing for one of the biggest clubs in the world. And... <laughs> I think, whether it's this season or another two seasons down the line, he's alongside Kenny Daglish and Steven Gerrard in terms of 
the top players to ever play for Liverpool and possibly one of the best wingers, if not the best wide player we've seen in this league. He hasn't got the medals that maybe some of the players have got in that uh, role. So do you fight to keep him? Of course you fight to keep him. So do you throw the money at him? Well, it's not about throwing the money at him. When, when you get a new contract, it's not about what you've done in the past, it's what you're going to do in the future. And more often than not for most players, when you get into your mid-30s, you can't, you can't do what you've done before. He might be different. Now, that's where I think the argument will be. Of course, Liverpool want to keep him and Virgil van Dijk, but it will probably be about wages. Are they still on the same wage that they're at? Because in the next two or three years, we'll be the same player. So that, that's the debate that we'll be having. But I'll be very surprised if Mo Salah isn't playing for Liverpool next season because I think he'll want to blitz every record in the club's history. You agree? I mean... I do. I, I feel, feel... So why are you having a go at me for Because I feel he I'm wants saying, to... I'm you saying were saying he, wants he said he's gonna, he wants to leave. And I'm saying... I don't That's believe not what I said. You said that he's, it's his last game at Manchester United. That's what he said. Yeah, but what I'm saying is I don't believe that in his mind he wants to leave the club. I don't believe that. I believe he's saying, look, Show me the money, baby. That, that's what I think he said. That's what I think he <laughs> yeah, said. But he would have great options, won't he? He will have the options. options he will have, and, and that would be tempting for him. Well, what, you say that, Roy, and, and, and I agree with you on a free transfer. Who wouldn't want Mo Salah? But I, I just think in the Premier League now is so strong. And that you, if, you, if you're in the top four in the Premier League and you're in the Champions League the following season, you've probably got a decent chance of getting to the quarter semis. Who else is... We always say Real Madrid or Barcelona. Barcelona are not the force that they've been. They've got huge financial problems. Real Madrid, we know, are a level above anyone. Would they bring in Mo Salah at but his he's age? gone abroad before, hasn't he? So his experience gone abroad before. And again, sometimes family <laughs> decisions, lifestyle. Listen, whatever we say, whether we like it or not, the money does come into it. And he's certainly getting offered more money than maybe what Liverpool could afford to give him. Mm. So all that has to go in the mix. But when he was here, he's, he was quite chirpy and quite happy, as he would be after a good <laughs> result. And he just come the end of the season, but he fancies just a new challenge, Jamie. That's all it is. Of course, leaving Liverpool would be difficult for him, no doubt about it. Sharp in everyone's minds, because he's been so brilliant today, because he's got this season on fire, three goals, three assists. And Daniel was obviously suggesting that he was leaving, but I wasn't, no, I wasn't <laughs> suggesting anything. Well, he said he is leaving. <laughs> I think he wants to stay, he wants a, uh, a contract so. offer very time soon. He talks about humility, he talks about accepting the fact that uh, they were second best against Liverpool today, and he says, Judge, just at the end of the season, we will win trophies. Still, Gary, you can't escape the fact this is a massive thump on the nose for Manchester United today. Yeah, it was a bad one. I mean, when the stadium's got about 20,000 fans left in at the end in a major game like this, then the f basically it's as bad as it can be and you're 3-0 down. I think the impact of taking Casemiro off will reverberate around the dressing room because he's one of the leaders, just like the Harry Maguire situation we'll have done a year and a half ago when someone in your dressing room that's important to the group and has got a voice obviously get, gets hooked at half-time like that and he's made two mistakes. It has a big impact, but... It's been a really challenging time for Manchester United for 10 years, whether you're Anthony, an 80 million winger, Di Maria, an 80 million pound winger, Sancho, who's just left this week, whether it's Marcus Rashford, who's a young kid that's coming through the ranks, who's struggling in the second half and the fans are on to him. It's really difficult and managers have struggled, not just Eric Ten Hag, every manager that's come to this club has struggled and there is a feeling today of, are we going to go through the same thing again? But I think it's a time for a bit of calm. It's, it's an international break, which is probably well needed for United. But Eric Ten Hag's going to have to get the club into a position sort of challenging for Champions League towards Christmas, or else he is going to be in trouble. He knows that. You know, he's been influenced to change his team, his staff in the summer. He's brought two new coaches in. That is not always ideal as well. So there's new messaging coming in, even though he's been here for two years. There is new technical directors, CEOs, there is a lot of change at the club, there are a lot of staff that have been here a long time that are leaving as well, so look, there was going to be some pain along the way of actually if you like, interfering with the Glazer ownership, we're seeing that pain right here today, it's not going to change quickly, it's a sobering day for United, but one that I think just requires some calm because we wanted change of ownership and we've got that and there is some things happening and we have to let it settle in and bed in. So you're calling for time and, and, and patience, quite rightly. Um, we're only three games into a new season, but I suppose the question is, when could this get difficult for Eric Ten Hag in particular? Particularly given the fact that they finished eighth last season and lost 14 games last season. That is... Well, the last week's been different. It's not a, it's not a clean slate in that sense. No, absolutely not. Um, again, finishing eight and the amount of games they lost last year, obviously they got out of it with the FA Cup. That kind of lifted everybody, but you look at them fixtures. But for Man United, you wouldn't be taking anything for granted. Southampton away, you know, there was... If Fulham here caused them problems. Um, Brighton obviously beat them, and now Brighton have gone along nicely. But every game for Man United, I think, would be tough. Particularly, again, when I go back to it, I keep repeating myself... When you make one or two mistakes and teams are getting at you that easily, then every game's going to be a challenge. Jamie, do you think that 
this manager needs time to deliver the change that the club is making, that Gary's talking about, that made some new signings, but debuts today. Or is there a danger that he is an obstacle to progress? I'd say the latter. I don't think anything's really going to change in terms of the football that we play. What we saw there, we saw a lot last season where teams are just running at Manchester United's back four. I've seen this with Liverpool, actually. You go back before Jürgen Klopp came in and there was talk of Brendan Rodgers losing his job at the end of one season. He wasn't sure what to do, FSG, and they kept him and they changed the staff, exactly what Eric Ten Hag's done here, and you'd expect something different. The manager's the main man. He dictates what goes on here, and the coaches, his philosophy of play, how he wants to play. And Brendan Rodgers was gone in October. And, I mean, Eric Ten Hag said in his interview, we'll see where we are at the end of the season. And, and yeah, it's early days, it's three games. I'd be surprised if he was still in charge at the end of the season, because... The football, the way they're talking about play, and Jason Wilcox, I think, made a statement last season uh, about a philosophy of play. There isn't one. We can see it with, with uh, slots in the first three games. Now, that doesn't mean it's going to be successful. There's different ways of playing, but you can already see something, the way they try and play, the, the profile of players that they're looking for. With Man United, it just looks like a mess of but players on the pitch. And, I, and, I, and if I'm being totally honest, I mean, I mentioned this before, but... The only ship didn't want to keep him. He won the cup final and it put them in a position where they weren't sure what to do. So then they were scurrying around Europe, speaking to agents and other managers, seeing if they could find someone better than Eric Ten Hag. They didn't feel like they could, so they stuck with the manager and they didn't have the nerve to make the change that they felt that they needed to do. We know that. And listen, it's probably delaying the inevitable. Does that make it impossible for him to be successful here, Gary? Look, there's no doubt. I don't agree with the nerve bit at the end. He used the word bottle up there on the gantry and that's why we were arguing for 20 minutes. But generally they Sorry, we don't we don't know about that so <laughs> what, well he said that the ownership bottled it and not getting rid of him what the Jamie ownership, said the ownership bottled it yeah right, at the end on. of the season up there you, listen, you can you know they did oh my god how can you, you say they bottled they it did. they were really open about the fact that they went and looked for a manager to try and replace Eric Ten Hag they couldn't find one Bayern Munich had a few months to replace Tuchel and found it difficult and ended up employing someone as a third and fourth choice Liverpool had six months to replace Klopp and employ Arna Slot was third choice it wasn't easy to get a manager at the end of last season for Manchester United or any club in so, Europe so you are openly admitting there they were looking for you another know, manager you just said it yeah, they, exactly they admitted it exactly what, so they're looking about? for somebody else and they can't actually get so they don't want this manager if you're happy with your manager you don't start speaking to other managers the people you're talking about Bayern Munich and Liverpool they knew the managers were no. going six months before the and end of the season and still couldn't find a manager I know it doesn't matter it does you matter. had to find somebody if you're happy with your manager right. you don't start Eric flying around Europe speaking to no, agents Eric Ten Hag wins the FA Cup and I think it shocks everybody it shocks, shocks Ineos and they then think well okay we'll still go and have a find if we can have a, we'll still go and look around Europe and see if we can find a manager they couldn't find a manager that they felt would take the club forward at this moment in time better than Eric Ten Hag could so he kept his job. Liverpool couldn't find the manager for second and third time. Neither could Bayern Munich. It was, it was hard to find managers last at the end of last season. A lot of clubs in Europe were trying to look for a manager and couldn't find one. Ineos tried to look for one to replace Eric Ten Hag. They couldn't do, so they decided, because he won the FA Cup, they would stick with him. What part of that don't they you understand? Could they have had okay. Arne you know Arne Slot? Arne Slot? Well, they didn't want Arne Slot, probably. They didn't think that Arne Slot was a more of a guarantee to take on this club more than what Eric Ten Hag was. Who, to be fair, it shouldn't be sniffed, by the way. It shouldn't be, like, demeaned that two trophies in two years winning the FA Cup is all of a sudden now a really bad time. Finishing eighth in the league is unacceptable. But they've won two trophies in two seasons. He pointed Manchester to that United's, this week. In Manchester United's mm. history, there were many seasons where they went years without winning trophies. So Alex Ferguson, it took him six, seven years to win the Premier League. It takes time sometimes. Jurgen Klopp, it took five years, six years. Art Arteta's on a journey of five, six years to try and win a Premier League. But if they're winning trophies along the way, well, do, they shouldn't in, be sniffed at. In, in Jürgen Klopp's think... third season, they were in the Champions League final and you could see something building going forward. We are, if you think... I don't, it's not good enough. We, it's what? It's not good enough. So how long... How long do you, I was think... it, why, was it, why was it going to... What, what, for the fact I'm saying that they, they, they bottled it in the summer, what was going to be different this season just by changing your staff? The, what the, difference were we going to see really, in Manchester United really, this really season? Really simply, there's a thought process that every manager that's been at Manchester United over the last 10 years is really bad, they're not good enough. Van, uh, ten, uh, what's he called? Van Gaal's not good enough. Ranić's not good enough. Solskjaer's not good enough. Mourinho's not good enough. Yeah, Moyes, you always blame Mo the Glazers. No, no, Who are you going to blame Moyes, now? Moyes is not good enough. So what they've tried to do is give a stable platform above him with different people, technical directors, sporting directors, head of recruitment, CEOs, all changed that actually it might not be the coach that's the problem at the club, it might be the fact that they've not got the right balance around them. So let's get the right support staff in, which is what they've done, and see whether this manager can thrive under a better leadership above him. That's what they've tried. I don't think that's wrong. Roy, do you see progress being made here? Um, 
No, I, listen, I, you'd be worried for the manager. I would never stand here and say I expect a manager to lose his job. But the pressure, no doubt, from last year. We obviously remember the FA Cup and they got out of jail in a few cup, in a few of the cup games. But the pressure must be building. Whatever you say, I think when you're playing for the big teams, and obviously Man United is one of the biggest, I, I'd, I'd hate this tag if I was playing that you're a cup team. And this is what this team is. And that means in terms of league, you can't turn up week in, week out. I'm not talking about challenging... Man City or even Arsenal, but I'm talking about competing with Liverpool, uh, Chelsea, obviously teams like Aston Villa who are at the moment, Spurs are in that mix. And at this moment in time, you, see, you look at Man United and they're slightly behind them. That's the worry for me, not, not what Man City and Arsenal are doing, because I do think it, 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 they need more so time. Do, do you just want to see progress? Is that what you're looking for? Is it better performances? Is it a consistency yeah, of performances? So. Is you it a style Klopp of play? What, when yeah, they first got in, but you always felt, and I know Arteta won the FA Cup pretty quickly and Klopp was getting to go. There was this element of he had people behind him. The feel good factor was coming back. But when you keep getting beaten, like they did last year at home, you finish in eight and you get beaten well today and you're on the back of a defeat against Brighton, you soon lose that. You know, as I mentioned earlier, when the stadium's getting empty after 60 minutes of the game is over, that will just be that will build massive pressure for the manager. Of course it will. It's only natural. But of course I wanted to turn things around. But the longer it takes and the more you come to matches here and you're getting beaten comfortably by one of your biggest rivals, of course the pressure's gonna build. Daniel, what's your take? You don't have to be a, an ex Manchester United player to have a view on what's going on here. No, I, I think from a from a for, formation perspective, they've gone about this in a way to try and get results, in my opinion. The the manager's, you know, missing players that he would probably prefer to have in his starting lineup so give him a bit of leeway there but I think in terms of how he set the team up today I watched them last week playing against Fulham well, I think it was Fulham last week the game last week they lost against Brighton sorry yeah. and I was like they're way too open they're playing like a 4-2-4 so for me before the game I was thinking surely they're not going to play against Liverpool the same way so I was disappointed with the way in which the team was set up because I was surprised by it to be honest they were way too open so it was inevitable that the result was going to be a win for Liverpool based on how Man United were playing, there's, in my opinion. There's, there's been lots of changes regarding listen, upstairs or whatever, but supporters want to see stuff on the pitch. Lots of changes. It's the same problems. But we've seen new signings out there today in, in Delict and Xerxes as well at the, at the end of a long list. Well, Lugate is at the end of that long list and, and uh, we haven't seen him yet. But in the Terek, Eric Ten Hag era, £616 million so far. I want to ask Daniel specifically on, on Delict and Xerxes. Do you think these are two players that can take this football club forward? I'll be totally transparent. I'm not quite sure. I think... <laughs> they're players who are good players. Do I think they're unbelievable top, top players? I'm not, uh, I'm not sure about that. But look, they're coming into a team where the managers identified these players to be guys who he believes can help the team move forward. So at the end of the day, Xerxes for me, played well at Bologna. He's got ability. The Ligt, you know, he's been at many top clubs and he's coming to Manchester United to try and change what's going on right now. But is he at peak form? Is he at the best he's ever been? I'm not sure. The biggest problem they've got at the moment that Manchester United is not a destination right now for the top players in Europe anyway. It just isn't. It, over the last 10 years, it has been a graveyard for players just generally that have come to the club with big reputations and they've not done well. Whether it's homegrown players, whether it's national players from Great Britain or whether it's players from international soil, one thing that Roy just said there is that when I came, I came back from Valencia, I think in the April, I came to a game, it was one of Louis van Gaal's last games, and I saw the stadium was sort of half empty during a match. I think they were playing Crystal Palace on like a Tuesday night, and I thought, that is, that is a signal. So today, there being 20, 25,000 in with five minutes to go is a real problem for Eric Ten Hag. That can't continue. And I think he'll get a few months to be able to get used to these new players coming in, Hoyland coming back, Agate coming in, and I think they'll assess it at that time. He can't be in eighth at the end of November and going into December. He's got to be up there in that top four or five. He has to be. So is sixth OK? Oh. I'm, I'm deadly serious. You <laughs> tell me, man, you, if, for you, you... No, you just don't say Manchester United, the biggest club in the world. Would Real Madrid or Bayern Munich accept being sixth in their league? We're saying eighth. That's where we are with Man United right now. That if he's in eighth in a couple of months, he'll be OK. You look eighth. at this team as well. You ask yourself, can you hang your hack? Are they, say, are they really hard to beat? Are they brilliant in terms of keeping clean sheets? You go, no, they're very open. Are they brilliant going forward, scoring loads of goals? You go, no, their goals record last year was probably one of the poorest in the top half. So you're looking to try and hang your hat in something, and you come to Old Trafford, you come watch your matches, and you're still kind of scratching your head. I'm hanging my hat on Ugarte. I believe he's a really good signing, and I think 
You've seen the stats, how he plays in Europe. He's one of the best defensive midfielders. It's what they need right now. So I, the reality I, of it is, if you're talking about breaking down play, transition, all these teams doing all these things, they are very open. His job and what he's great at is helping defense. Can I, I have no problem, sorry, but these players were, were mentioned there, there's, and there's lots to go through, and the lads again mentioned today. There's no doubt these are good players, but I think they're coming from different leagues, and a lot of obviously from uh, the Dutch league that he's worked with before. But the challenge is physically and mentally in the Premier League. I think that's the big challenge. There's no doubt these are good players, and they go and play for big clubs and other leagues. But the challenge is the Premiership, that physical, being at it week in, week out. And a lot of these players, because they're now a cup team, don't seem to do it week in, week out. And the sign of a really top player and a top team is they turn up every week. And even on a bad day, they, they grind out a result. This team doesn't do it. When, when you're talking about where this team's going, let's go back to the beginning. The first player he wanted to sign was Frankie de Jong as a whole midfield player. We know what type of player he is. Liverpool tried to do exactly the same and didn't get their man Zuba Mendy. Liverpool then didn't go and buy a completely different player in Casemiro to fill that role. They've gone with what they've got. And obviously we've seen the kiss, uh, situation with Casemiro today, unfortunately for the lad. But that, how has that happened? where he's in a situation where he's now actually got five players, I think he had at Ajax. How are we not seeing his thing? The club have allowed him to spend hundreds of millions of pounds by players from the Dutch league, players he's worked with before, and we still don't see anything really about where this club's going or the style of playing. And it's not even just about Man United need to win, and you know, Man United should always be competitive. But surely a manager now, after this long, we should see what his team's about. We see it with Postacoglu as soon as he comes in. Now, that doesn't mean they're going to be successful. They're doing okay, Spurs. We don't know which slot, but we're still asking quite the same questions of this manager and, and to Gary's point he is surely going to get time given that he's been allowed to make more signings of players that he has worked with before and this is with the new hierarchy so he says judges at the end of the season we will win trophies so uh, I'm thinking back a couple of weeks the Monday night football predictions Gary do you think that that Manchester United will finish above Liverpool this season yeah why not I might as well go down fighting and burning. <laughs> <laughs> go down swinging, bro. I'm, only, I'm Manchester United fan. I've sat on this Look, Liverpool and City have been outstanding. If Jurgen Klopp was the manager in the last seven or eight years, uh, Liverpool will have challenges during this season. Liverpool are a better team than Manchester United at this moment in time. Of course they are, but I'm going to back my team. Of course I'm going to back my team. Why not, Roy? Yeah, I'm going to stick with United. I have to. You're just saying it just to say it now. We're looking at you. You're just saying it just to say it, bro. Just relax. Just relax. All right, say let's say let's say let's say let's not. I still think United will get in the top four. Hey, we're only three games in, aren't we? So, exactly. He wants him sacked. And Anastasia said himself, "We are only three games in." I don't want him sacked. I want him to stay. <laughs>